Hello, students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And today's video, we're gonna start a new chapter. We're gonna start taking a look at what's going on inside of a rigid body versus always just working, worrying about what's going on outside. Okay, so we've talked about externally equivalent things going on. We are now, instead of just looking externally, we're looking internally. So to define the four different kinds of internal loadings, uh, let's start with one that we should be familiar with because we talked about this quite a bit with two force members. These are axial forces. And of course, axial forces are either tension or compression. Uh, we tend to use the letter A. Some textbooks use the letter N, calling them normal forces. I like axial and A. And so you can think if we have a rigid body, which is in purely tension, right? We know that tension pulls always. And so what we're gonna do quite a bit in this section is we're gonna cut through beams, okay? We're gonna bring out the blue saw and cut this beam in two. And so what we're gonna find is that we have the left end and the right end, okay? So our external forces here are still pulling forces. And so it should make sense that if we cut in this middle part and the only forces we have are pulling forces, then we also need basically an exposed internal force here, which is also going to be pulling. Okay, so just a quick note here, um, just in definitions, we call these applied So just to put a few definitions here, we call these applied forces, right? Applied to the outside. Now these may come from an interaction with another member, but at least for this, for given this one body, we don't really know what it's interacting with. So let's call those applied. And these two here would be internal. Okay, so that's this idea of internal loading. The other kind of axial force that we've talked about is compression. Now we know that compression always pushes I'll label this one C. So compression pushes. And so if we cut this member in the middle again and draw our two separate free body diagrams, shouldn't be a big surprise here, still applied compression, applied compression, internal, also compression. Right? And this is fundamentally what we're doing when we do the method of section, method of joints, right? We cut either around a joint or we cut through a truss in a section and we exposed these internal forces, okay? So like I said, that one should be familiar. The next few will not, they're all new, okay? So the next one we'll talk about are shear forces. Now, shear forces are defined as forces which cut across a beam. Okay, so if you think about scissors, another name for scissors is actually shears, okay? So if we have a beam And now instead of having um, the axial forces, let's go ahead and put just a distributed load across here. Okay. So basically shear forces is going to give us a differential of forces which are perpendicular to the beam. Okay, so we're gonna cut across the beam. So they're at 90 degrees from the axial forces. Okay, so if we cut across this beam, and notice I also cut across the load. When you cut across a beam, you cut across the load as well. We can create two different halves. One of those So there's the left half. Here's the right half. Here's our external support force, this portion of the distributed load, this portion of the distributed load, and my force right here. So in exposing what's going on inside here, and this is also gonna bring in a sign convention, 
is that we're going to call positive shear going downward on this right cut face. Okay, this is a positive V and upward on this left cut face. Okay, positive V. Notice that these are equal and opposite, right? One's going up, one's going down because they have to cancel each other out just like our axial forces up, to, up here have to cancel each other out as well. Let me add one more note up here on the axial forces because there's a sign convention associated with this. We call tension forces positive and we call compression forces negative. Okay, so adding in a sign convention on top of basically talking about defining these different forces. Okay, so tension is positive, compression is negative. And then here in shear, we call, now you can either say down on the right and up on the left is going to be positive. I actually like to think about that these two shear forces, right? This force here would try to rotate the body in this direction. This shear force here would try to rotate this body in the same exact direction. Okay, both of those using the right hand rule, wrapping your fingertips around. This is positive from the right, excuse me, this is negative from the right hand rule. So this is negative from the right hand rule. This is also negative from the right hand rule. So we can also say in words that our positive shear V is either up on the right cut face and down on the left cut face. Or we can also say that positive shear attempts to rotate the beam in a negative right hand rule direction. Okay, so I know that that's like, like, why? Why is it always negative? It's just a sign convention. Okay, we come up with sign conventions basically to come up with consistent. Um, signs across all people. Now, the other thing that these sign conventions are going to do for us is it's actually going to line up content you're going to learn in section 8.1 of your book, which is looking at internal loading at a single point, and also later in chapter 8, looking at external loading across the entire beam, or you call those shear and moment diagrams. Okay? So that's how we define positive shear. The next type of internal force we have is a bending moment. And this is the classic type of resistance we get to a beam. Um, even as we define a beam, we say that a beam carries a load in bending. Okay, so we use the letter M for a bending moment, and it is defined as a moment which flexes a beam in one plane. Okay, so as we talk about a bending moment, if we have similarly loaded beam we had for shear, some vertical supports here in the end, let's put a distributed load across the middle. You can probably fairly easily see that with these supports not moving, that this beam is going to bend in this direction. Okay, and we often will say that a positive moment M causes the beam to smile. Okay, so like smiling would be good, frowning would be bad, so positive and negative. So if I draw some cut portions
Now I'm not going to draw the externally applied forces just to make these a little bit simpler. So here would be our positive moment. Here would be our positive moment, right? Noting that both of these would cause this beam fundamentally to smile upwards like this. Now, um, recognize that the moment over here on the left-hand side is positive from the right-hand rule. The moment over here on the right-hand side is negative from the right-hand rule, right? The right-hand rule fundamentally is a different sign convention than we're using here for internal loading. Okay, so we're still going to base some things on the right hand rule, just like we did up here for shear. We talked about it's, that these positive shear are trying to rotate the beam in a direction opposite the right hand rule. So it's a good basis for comparison, but it is a different sign convention. Okay, now if you have a vertical beam, which we often call a column, so one way I often think about this, if I just throw an axis system on here, x and y. Then in a, in a vertical beam, cutting across here, and then here's my cut face, the other chunk of a vertical beam. So if you have a vertical beam, we assume positive is going out here toward a positive x direction. Just like we assume for a horizontal beam, that positive moment that these arrowheads here, right? The direction that those arrowheads are going is towards that positive y direction okay so smiling works for all horizontal beams but then if you have a vertical beam or a column and you're trying to look at the positive moment um, we can still use that smiling analogy it's just smiling up to the positive axes right all right the last kind of internal loading which we could have in a beam is torsion Now, torsion is not going to be covered in statics. You will end up picking up some knowledge on torsion as you get into solids. So we're not going to talk too much about it here, but you'll pick up information here in CIVI 360 solids. And if you're not at Colorado State University, your university may call this mechanics of materials. Okay, So it is a fourth type of internal loading, but we're going to focus just on bending moments, shear forces, and axial forces. Okay, so th those are the four different types. So fundamentally, the process to solve for the internal loading at any given point is basically to cut the beam at that point, choose whether you want to solve on the right or left side, draw all the assumed positive um, shear, moment, and axial load, and then solve for them. Okay, so it's really just be create a free body diagram, then use equations of equilibrium. So we'll walk through an example that can show you exactly how to do this process. So here is an example that we are going to solve for our internal loading, our axial shear and moment. Uh, first at point C, and then we're also going to set up the free body diagrams to solve it at point D. Okay, so please go ahead and pause the video so you can get this drawn out. I've also went ahead and solved for our support forces just to make our um, progress to this problem a little bit quicker. So because of this external horizontal force here, five, five newtons on the right end, I'm going to have a five newton horizontal force needed to the left over at A sub X. A sub Y turned out to be 23.75 and B sub Y 16.25 newtons, both those going upward to support the downward concentrated load of 10 newtons and a distributed load of two newtons per meter. Okay, so as we get into drawing the free body diagram of this beam solving for our internal loading at C, I have two options, okay? One of these options, and I'll draw both of them, is be, it will be to use the left end of the beam, and then I'll make a little space here, and then we'll draw the right end of the beam. All right, so on the left end, we have an applied no force here, applied load of 10 newtons. Uh, we have our support force here, five meters over, which had a vertical component of 23.75 newtons, and horizontal coming back here to the left 
of 5 newtons. Okay, so those are my applied loads on that left hand portion. Once again here, I'm cutting here through point C. Now I draw my assumed positive axial shear and moment. Let me go ahead and zoom in. And so my assumed axial is in tension. So there's my assumed positive axial. My assumed positive shear is basically attempting to rotate this body opposite the right hand rule, right? Down on the right cut face and up on the left cut face. So let me just put a little note out here. This is positive A, positive V. And my positive moment is going to cause that beam to smile, okay? So in the same way, and since I'm zoomed in, let me just go ahead and write in the ones here. So my assumed positive axial is still going to be in tension. My assumed positive shear on this one is opposite the other one, right? Going up on this left cut face. And then my assumed positive moment, put the label down here, is those three. Okay, so another way you could look at these if you wanted to. If you're a better memorizer than process-oriented thinker, I'd encourage you to be both. But these are going to be your assumed positive axial shear and moment for any horizontal beam. Okay, they'll never change. You're going to have the exact same sets. Now, let's look at the rest of the forces on the right end. Um, we had five newtons applied uh, at point B. We had B sub Y, our support force here, of 16.25 newtons. Now, this 2 newton meter distributed load, right, we just learned about distributed loads here in the previous video, has a total area, right, it's 15 meters long times 2 newtons per meter. So it turns out that it's externally equivalent load. 2 times 15 is 30 newtons and that is going to be located at a distance of 7.5 meters from this right end right because it was 15 meters total so half of its length so fundamentally that's how we use our knowledge of distributed load to turn this distributed load into a point load all right so looking at these two free body diagrams i'm going to choose the one on the left to solve just because um I don't know. They're, they're both about the same. They actually both have the same number of forces applied. So um, we'll choose the one here on the left. And so starting with our equations, of course, you can choose to some moments anywhere you want, some forces in the X, some force in the Y, right? That's kind of the spectrum of our equations. I'll go in this kind of standard order. Not that you have to go in this order, but it works on this one. So some of the force in the X is equal to zero. Our X forces, now as soon as you go to some forces and you realize, hey, I don't have an axis system, add your axis system, okay? Um, that's actually the cue I use in my brain is anytime I write this portion right here, my brain says, oh, you need an axis system. All right, and so in the X direction, we only have two forces, we have, our um, axial force pulling to the right, assumed positive tension, and then we have minus five newtons at that support force. This is equal to zero, therefore A is equal to five newtons. Noting we assumed it was in tension, we ended up with a positive value, and so if you wanted to just confirm that, we have, we have a tension, internal tension there at point C. Uh, next, we could go ahead and sum our forces in the y direction. Summing force in the y direction, I have minus 10 newtons on the left end. I have a plus 23.75 newtons. And then noting here that my shear is pointing down, but every single free body diagram that I convert into equations of equilibrium are going to be based upon your axis system as opposed to based upon your sign convention. Okay, so let me just put that as a little note here, that the sign convention and so this is our A, V, and M sign convention is only for drawing free body diagrams. Not for solving them. Sorry, I kind of squeezed that in there. But this, these sign conventions are to set up our free body diagrams for success. But then when we go to solve our free body diagrams, we use our standard 
pick an axis, use right hand rule for all your moments, call positive things in the x positive, negative things in the x negative, right? Just using our axis system. So therefore, after all that commentary, do you think that this shear force pointing downward on the left hand free body diagram, and let me go ahead and get in a good habit here. Let me call this one, let me call it one, and let me label these equations down here, one just to be really explicit about what equations are coming from each free body diagram. Okay, so that shear is going down, therefore I'm going to label it as negative because it's in the negative y direction. Again, we use our axis system for solving our equations of equilibrium. We don't use our axial shear and moment sign conventions. Sign conventions to set up the free body diagrams, equations of equilibrium and axes to solve them. Okay, this equals zero, therefore my shear is equal to a value of 13.75 newtons. We've got a positive value here, therefore it basically validates we have positive shear at that point. And then the last thing we could do is we could sum our moments. Now you'll find that the best place usually to sum moments is your cut face. Okay, so summing moments here at point C. Now again here, using our standard sign convention, wrapping our fingers around in the direction of that moment, we get a positive internal couple M. We then also have a negative, see the distance over to the 23.75 as given in the problem sketch. C was halfway between um, the distributed load and A, so this is going to be 2.5 times 23.75 and then we also have a moment from the 10 newton force and this is the total distance of 7.5 times 10 and that moment is positive from the right hand rule and this equals zero just like all other equilibrium equations so we find out that m is equal to negative 15.625. Okay, and this would be in Newton meters. So we actually assumed, and I could label these if I wanted to, A sub C, V sub C, M sub C. Now here is that case where labeling my couple as M and also summing moments at M. You're welcome in this case if you want to to call it your couple C, it's like C sub C versus M sub C, if this causes any confusion, right? Realize that this is like a mathematical operator. Sum your moments at point C. This is an internal couple at point C, okay? Um, so just pointing out that those are different even though they look a whole bunch the same, which again is one of the reasons I like to call couples often capital C versus um, moments. So so um, we find out we have a, def um, a moment which is negative as defined by our shear and moment sign convention. And it'll turn out when we draw a diagram of all the shear and moment in this entire beam, we'll have a negative value for moment, we'll have a positive value for shear. Okay, so these will line up. Now the last step we were asked to do is go ahead and write just the free body diagrams, not do all the solving. If we go ahead and um, find our internal loadings at point D, which is located a distance of seven meters from B. Okay, so we're cutting through point D. Uh, if you want to, you can add all of your external forces, 10 Newtons, we had a reaction um, here of 23.75. Um, let me go ahead and just add my reaction over here, and then I'll talk about that distributed load, 16.25, and then we had 5 newtons pulling there and 5 newtons pulling back over here. All right. Realize when we cut the beam at D, we also cut the load. Therefore, we're not going to have the full two, 2 newtons per meter over 15 meters, but we are going to have two newton meters over seven meters right so this is two newtons per meter and the length here from this end over to this end is seven meters and then over on this body we're going to have the remaining eight meters right at two newtons per meter and like i said the distance from here to here this is eight meters and then it was an additional five meters to here, and then an additional 
five meters to the end. Okay, so you can also see where in talking about free body diagrams and adding dimensions, this is where quite possibly adding these dimensions can be helpful. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to add our internal assumed positive, right? Assumed positive is axial. A plus assumed positive attempts to rotate it opposite the right-hand rule. Assume positive V, and then assume positive moment makes it smile. Now see if you can draw the ones over here on the right face. Pause the video. Coming back from your pause, assumed positive coming to the left, assumed positive going up, and assumed positive making it smile. Okay, so again, as I mentioned before, it's the exact same three directions that we'll have for every cut face of a horizontal beam. Now realize what you're going to do with these distributed loads and these free body diagrams is you're actually going to convert those into point forces. Okay, before you can solve for A, V, and M, you need to figure out what's going on with this two Newton per meter. So I'm not going to redraw these free body diagrams completely. Actually, I'm just going to cheat here and erase this and say, hey, by the way, that distributed load over eight meters is equal to 16 newtons, and this is going to be located here at four meters from the cut face, just like over here with the distributed load. That it was seven newton, sorry, two newton meters over seven, so 14 newtons, and this is located at half of its length here, so this is going to be 3.5 meters. So this now gives you free body diagrams. You can apply your equations of equilibrium. It does not matter which one you pick. You can pick the left, you can pick the right. You'll get the exact same values for your axial, your moment, and your shear. The values will likely be different than they were at point C. Uh, to be honest on this problem, your axial load will be the same. Your shear and moment will be different, okay? And so as we'll transition to the next section, we're actually gonna learn to draw a diagram across this entire beam, because really what's often important is finding the maximum value of shear and the maximum value of moment, as opposed to isolated values at any one point. Hope you're having a great day.